a great hymn. Thank you, Celeste. If you can remember four words, you can remember the title of my message, my subject, and my outline for this morning's message. Just four words. Providence, election, grace, reprobation. That's the subject of Romans chapter 11, verses 1 through 10. Providence, election, grace, and reprobation. In preparation for our Bible conferences every year, I always try, if the Lord allows me to do so, to prepare and preach messages to you in the week or two leading up to the conferences that will lay before you what you're about to hear from those men who will be preaching the gospel of God's grace to you during the conference. Our annual conference is always billed as a sovereign grace Bible conference. I choose the words deliberately, both with reference to our continual labors here as a congregation, the message we preach, and in speaking to others, sending out brochures and so forth with regard to the conference. A sovereign grace Bible conference, a Bible conference intended to show men and women the blessed, glorious gospel of God's free and sovereign grace precisely as it is set before us in the pages of Holy Scripture. The preachers are never assigned subjects. I, uh, thus far in the years I've been preaching, I have never suggested to another preacher what he ought to preach at any given time. I just, I just don't do it. I don't try to play the role of the Spirit of God and tell me what to preach. But I assure you that those men who come to preach to you are always men who will preach in this pulpit what they consistently, regularly, relentlessly preach in their own pulpits. I will never have a man stand here and preach to you of whom I am not certain preaches the gospel of God's free grace without apology wherever he preaches. My message is this morning, and again tonight, if God is pleased to bless them to your heart, will be messages to prepare you for next weekend. Messages that will whet your appetite for that which you will hear next weekend. This morning's message, providence, election, grace, and reprobation, certainly does so. And tonight I plan to preach to you from Isaiah 9, 6, and 7 about the subject, This is My Savior. So let's look at Romans chapter 11, verses 1 through 10 this morning, line by line and phrase by phrase, asking God the Holy Ghost to inscribe on our hearts the things that are here revealed in his word. May he be pleased now to take the things of Christ and show them to us. Here the Lord God shows us by his inspired apostle how he accomplishes the salvation of his elect and brings upon the wicked by providence, election, and grace, and reprobation, his eternal purpose. He shows us how it is that God, by providence, election, grace, and reprobation, brings salvation to his elect and brings judgment upon the wicked. I remind you, Paul had been telling us about God's great, eternal, sovereign purpose of grace throughout chapters 8, 9, and 10. And he continues with that same subject in this chapter. He's showing us God's purpose of grace as it involves all men, Jew and Gentile, bond and free, learned and unlearned, black and white, male and female, in all ages, in every part of the world, throughout the ages of history. After writing as he did in chapter 10, about the fact that God had cast off the Jews and the Jews as a nation are now lost and blind and in darkness and that God sent the gospel to the Gentiles. He, he sent the gospel to call out his elect among the Gentiles, which of course is you and me. Paul saw objections arising 
from his adversaries. Gospel preachers always have their adversaries. Adversaries who do not hesitate to twist, pervert, and misrepresent what the preacher of the gospel declares. I had a long talk with a friend last night, a pastor who's uh, having to deal right now with one of those adversaries. An adversary who uh, pretends to be sweet and loving and kind and uh, a peacemaker. And, you know, you want to take him out behind the shed and beat the fool out of him. Because he's a deceiver, cunning, crafty. Uh, but uh, you just leave him alone and preach the gospel to God's people. These folks that Paul is speaking of here, uh, they misrepresent Paul's words. And Paul anticipates them saying, well, Paul, if what you're saying is so, what does that mean? Has God cast away his people? Are all the Jews forever damned? Where is God's covenant with Israel? What about God's promise to Abraham? How are his promises to Israel and Abraham and to Isaac and Jacob to be fulfilled? Is there no hope then of the Jew being saved, obtaining God's righteousness? And in this chapter, Paul answers their questions. First, speaking of providence. He uses himself in verse 1 as a marvelous example of the work of God's good providence in salvation. Read the 107th Psalm as often as you can, remembering that in Psalm 107, the apostle show, or the prophet shows us by divine inspiration how that God wisely manipulates the affairs of a man's life. He wisely manipulates the events of the world for the saving of his people so that God's providence is altogether engaged in accomplishing the everlasting good, the everlasting salvation of his chosen people redeemed by the blood of his darling son, the Lord Jesus. Paul tells us that back in chapter 8. Turn back there for a moment and read it. Romans chapter 8, verse 28. We know that all things work together for good to them that love God, to them who are the called according to his purpose. God is accomplishing everything in time to save those people whom he did foreknow, for whom he did, uh, I'm sorry, whom he did foreknow, he also did predestinate and predestinated them to be conformed to the image of his son that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. Moreover, whom he did predestinate, them he also called. And whom he called, them he also justified. And whom he justified, them he also glorified. Well, what are you going to say to this? What shall we then say to these things? We'll say this. If God be for us, all hell can't resist us. If God be for us, all hell can do us no harm. If God be for us, who can be against us? Everything God does in providence, everything, 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 he does for the salvation of his elect. In the opening verse of chapter 11, God the Holy Spirit inspired Paul to tell us the reason for Israel's existence as a nation was the salvation of his elect, his true Israel, Abraham's true spiritual seed. Look at verse 1. I say then, hath God cast away his people? God forbid. God forbid. He answers with his usual way of doing so with an expression of disgusting astonishment. How dare you make such a presumption? How dare you think such a thing? For I also am an Israelite of the seed of Abraham, of the tribe of Benjamin. Paul says, the Lord saved me, and I'm a Jew. That means God has not cast away all the nation of Israel. There are some that God spares even when God acts in judgment. Hold your hands here in Romans 11 and turn back to a passage uh, many of you read this week earlier. Ezekiel chapter 9 and chapter 20. Ezekiel chapter 9. 
Ezekiel found himself in a similar position. Here, God's judgment, Ezekiel tells us, is falling upon the nation of Israel. Falling upon that nation for precisely the same reason as it did in Paul's day. Particularly falling upon the city of Jerusalem. And Ezekiel saw the Lord Jesus Christ as the man clothed with a linen garment, the ecorn by his side, coming in judgment against that nation. He was sent in judgment. But before he came in judgment, he set a mark upon the foreheads of the men that sigh and cry for all the abominations committed by the people of Israel. And then in verse 8, when the judgment came, Ezekiel being preserved by Christ made this statement. And it came to pass while they were slaying them, and I was left. I was spared. I was spared. I was spared. Then I fell on my face and cried and said, Ah, Lord God, ah, Lord Jehovah, wilt thou destroy all the residue of Israel in thy pouring out of the, thy fury upon Jerusalem? And then when we get to chapter 20, look at verse 33. The Lord God explained to Ezekiel and explains to us what he was doing then and what he's doing now. Ezekiel 20, verse 33. As I live, saith the Lord God, surely with a mighty hand and with a stretched out arm, that is, omnipotent grace, and with fury poured out, justice satisfied by Christ, will I rule over you. That's how he comes to rule you as your sovereign Lord and King. Omnipotent grace and with fury poured out to the satisfaction of justice. And I will bring you out from the people and will gather you out of the countries wherein you're scattered with a mighty hand and with a stretched out arm, with that omnipotent grace and with fury poured out by that justice satisfied in Christ. And I will bring you into the wilderness of the people. And there will I plead with you face to face, like as I pleaded with your fathers in the wilderness of the land of Egypt. So will I plead with you, saith the Lord God, and I will cause you to pass under the rod, like a shepherd bringing his sheep into the fold, counting them as they come in. So will I bring you into the bond of the covenant. I'll bring you, my covenant people, into the blessed experience of my covenant grace. And I will purge out from among you the rebels and them that transgress against me. And I will bring them forth out of the country where they sojourn, and they shall not enter into the land of Israel. And ye shall know that I am the Lord. Verse 41. I will accept you. I will accept you with your sweet savor. When I bring you out from the people and gather you out of the countries wherein you've been scattered. That's what happens when God saves sinners. He causes the sinner who knows his sin, alienates him from God, separates him from God. Suddenly, God speaks peace to his heart and accepts him. And you find acceptance in Christ the beloved. And look what God says. And I will be sanctified in you. I will be honored in you before the heathen. Back here in Romans 11. Paul says, I stand before you as proof positive that God has not cast away his people. Though the nation of Israel has been cast off, none of the Israel of God, none of God's elect, None of Abraham's spiritual seed, none of God's true children have been cast off or ever will be. You see, God's elect are the salt of the earth. The salt of the earth. Now, we use that expression with regard to men, women that we have high regard for, think how they say, boy, they're the salt of the earth. And we use it wrongly. 
when we use it like that. What we're saying is they're, they're as good as you get. They're as good as you get. That's not the meaning of the words. Ye are the salt of the earth. You who are gods. What does that mean? God's elect are the preservers of the world. God preserves the world only for the saving of his elect. Providentially, all the earth, all people, all nations, including Israel and the United States, are preserved and kept from utter destruction by divine judgment only for the saving of God's elect. Our nation, by law, pays women to murder their babies in their womb. We pass laws almost every year in some state in the Union to promote sodomy, to promote ungodliness, and in every way possible, rid the nation of the name of Jesus Christ and the worship of God. That's the nation we live in. That's the nation we uh, I, I, I sometimes laugh and sometimes I just get mad. I listen to these uh, political pundits, listen to folks, sodomites and uh, adulterers and fornicators and drunks. Sit on television talk about somebody, uh, uh, this is a moral issue. What on earth would you know about it? <laughs> a moral issue. Uh, how, how can you dare even speak the word moral? But we live in such a nation. That's the way we live. That's how the nation exists. Why doesn't God destroy this place? For just one reason. For just one reason. Not because we're any better than any other nation. We certainly are not. For just one reason. God Almighty has a people whom he will save using the sons of Ham in this generation as in every other generation, for the everlasting benefit of Shem and Japheth, his elect. The physical nation of Israel has been cast away, but they're not utterly destroyed because God has some of his elect among them. The world, though obviously cast away in divine judgment as a whole, as we read in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, religious is all get out, but reprobate. Yet it exists still because God yet has in this world a people chosen by his grace, redeemed by the blood of his son, who must and shall be saved. God's not willing that any of those chosen redeemed ones should perish, but that all should come to repentance and knowledge of the truth, and so it shall be. Beholding these things, beholding the judgment of God all around us, Every saved sinner ought, like Ezekiel, cry out with thanksgiving, and I was spared. You see, the drunkard, the sodomite, the adulterer, the fornicator, the murderer of babies, we're no different from them. Our hearts are no different. We're not one iota above them. Not one. Not one. But I'm spared. I was left. God let me never get over it. I was left. I try to remind myself and my wife and she tries to remind herself and me every time we start talking about the religion of this age. Uh, that's where we were, and that's where we'd still be if God hadn't stepped in. Don't ever forget it. Don't ever get over the wonder of it. And I was spared. Let us then fall on our faces before the throne of God, crying with gratitude and praise. Ah, Lord God, and I was spared. That's the secret to understanding God's providence. He who is our God does all things 
for the salvation of his elect. Let me then be content with God's providence and leave it all in his hands. Let me not murmur or complain with God's providence, but rather trust him for his grace. Second, in verses 2 through 5, here's divine election. Here's an emphatic, important statement. God hath not cast away his people, which he foreknew, neither among the Jews nor among the Gentiles. There is a sense, of course, in which all mankind are God's people. All are his creatures. All are his subjects. All are his possession. All are his property to do with as he will. That's you and me and everybody else. God is not our property, we are God's property. God is not in our hands to do with as we will, we are in God's hands for him to do with as he will. And we bow to his will as we acknowledge him being God. All are his by creation, but not all are foreknown by him. That is, not all are the objects of his eternal love and his purpose of grace. Many will hear him say in the last day, in the great day of judgment, Depart from me, ye cursed, I never knew you. That doesn't mean he didn't know who they were or what they had done. Obviously, they're going to hell because he knew who they were and what they had done. He said, I never loved you. I never purposed your salvation. I never did anything for you. I never benefited you with my grace. I never knew you. Those are strong words. Even so, Israel was chosen from among the nations. They were called the people of God and were blessed with the promises, prophets, the law, the sacrifices, the ceremonies of, of given to Israel. But all were not foreknown. We know that because the vast majority of them were told in the fourth chapter of Hebrews, perished in the wilderness and went to hell. They were not all foreknown. Elijah made intercession, not for Israel, but against them in 1 Kings 19. He, uh, he said, Lord, they've killed your prophets. They tore down your altars. They're a bunch of idolaters. And he prayed against Israel. Look at verse 3. Lord, they have killed thy prophets and dig down thine altars, and I am left alone, and they seek my life. Mm. But how did God respond to Elijah? He, uh, he thought that he was all by himself. He was the only one left that knew and worshiped God. Verse 4. But what saith the answer of God to him? You remember in a still, small voice, God by his spirit said to Elijah, I have reserved to myself 7,000 men, a perfect total number, exactly the number I intend, exactly the number I purposed, a complete body, 7,000 men who have not bowed the knees to the image of Baal. God cast away the vast majority as you'd look at it, in, our, in Elijah's day. And he has in our day, as Paul writes here in Romans 11, cast away the vast majority of the Jewish nation. Since men like Elijah are like they are, let us remind ourselves we are like them. And sincere men like Elijah are often wrong. Even faithful men sometimes despair. Even faithful men sometimes despair even for God's calls, for God's church, and for God's honor. Sometimes. You see, we're just flesh. When the church and calls of Christ seem the lowest, when idolatry, superstition, and heresy are seemingly in full command, God always has a people whom he foreknew, whom he redeemed, and whom he has called or shall call, always.
and they're exactly as many as he intends. Exactly as many. Who's sitting here this morning listening to this message? I'll tell you who. Everybody who wants to. Anybody who's not here is not here because they don't want to be here. Or they're absolutely unable to be here. Those are the only way you can look at it. And I'll tell you another way. Everybody God intends to be here. Everybody. He brings men in and keeps them away exactly according to his purpose. Exactly according to his purpose. Who, who, who believes God? Who hears the gospel? Who's saved by God's grace? In every place, in every generation, at all times, exactly as many as God has purposed to save by his grace. Understand this and rejoice in it. Few in this apostate generation of will worship idolaters do. God's grace is discriminating grace. It's always discriminating grace. All who are gods are separated from and distinguished from the rest of Adam's race by special foreknowledge, that is, by electing love, by special redemption, by limited atonement, by special calling, by irresistible grace. As it was in Elijah's day, so it is today. Look at verse 5. Even so, then, at this present time also, there is a remnant according to the election of grace. There always has been, there is now, there always shall be until time shall be no more. Even so at this present time, there is a remnant according to the election of grace. Elijah wasn't the only believer in his day. And Paul wasn't the only believing Jew in his day. God's elect in any age among any people may be but few, nothing but a remnant. But God has a people, exactly as many as he has chosen, according to the election of grace. Those who are God's. Oh, how I thank God for electing love. God chose us. That's the reason we believe. God chose us in Christ. God chose us in eternity. God chose us to make us like Christ. God chose us according to his will and nothing else. That's God's election. Number three, Paul talks about God's grace. He tells us again that all the work of salvation is by grace and by grace alone. Look at what it says, verse 6. And if by grace, then it is no more works. Otherwise, grace is no more grace. But if it be of works, then it is no more gra uh, grace. Otherwise, work is no more work. What then? Israel hath not obtained that which he seeketh for, but the election hath obtained it, and the rest were blinded. Now, almost all religious people, most of them, believe in some kind of election. Um, most everybody say, well, election is talking about election to salvation. And folks who do acknowledge that elections are like election to service, rather. And folks who do acknowledge that election is to salvation say, well, God looked out in time. And he foresaw that you would choose him, so he chose you. God looked out in time and he knew what you'd do, so he decided to do something. <laughs> uh, any fool knows better, but most men are fools when it comes to Scripture. The Bible never talks about conditional election, only unconditional election. God elected us according to his own sovereign eternal will, his own sovereign purpose of mercy, love, and grace, and our works have nothing to do with it. Left to ourselves, we would never love God, we would never seek God, we would never come to God, we would never believe on the Son of God. Our Savior said, Ye will not come to me that you might have life. That's true of everybody. No man can come to me except my Father which sent me draw him. That's true of everybody. The singular force by which sinners believe 
is the force of God. Almighty, omnipotent, irresistible grace. Well, Brother Don, if you tell people things like that, they'll get the idea that there's nothing they can do to get saved. I hope you do. That's my intention. There's not one thing you can do to get saved. Not one thing you can do to save yourself. If you're saved, you'll be saved because God Almighty saved you according to his purpose of grace in eternity. The doctrine of the Bible is crystal, crystal clear. There's no room for misunderstanding here. Salvation is by the pure, free, unmerited, eternal, sovereign, irresistible grace of God. Works have nothing to do with it. And if you push your works in, I don't care if it's just the end of your little fingernail. You push your works in, you push grace out. Any mixture of grace with works is a complete denial of grace, a complete departure from grace, a complete apostasy from grace. Paul said, if you be circumcised, Christ shall profit you nothing. He said, if you be circumcised, you're fallen. You've apostatized from the grace of God. This grace is altogether according to God's purpose. It is not of him that willeth, nor of him that runneth, but of God that showeth mercy. Look at verse 7. What then? What do we make of all this? I'll tell you what to make of it. Salvation is of the Lord. It is by his purpose, by his purchase, and by his performance. Israel hath not obtained that which he seeketh for. The whole of religion, be it Jewish, Islamic, Protestant, Papist, Hindu, the whole of religion, the whole of religion is men want to make themselves righteous before God. The Jews seek righteousness by their obedience to the law. The Muslim seeks righteousness by his obedience to the Koran. The Papist and the Protestant and, the, and most Baptist folks, most religious folks you know, conservative and liberal, seek righteousness by obeying the Scriptures. And they, they uh, and you, you won't have a good testimony before me, and so fellows will look at you and say, boy, boy, Don Fort, he's a good man. He's a right. I know he's sincere. I can see godliness written all over him. If they can see it, that ain't what it is. That ain't what it is. No, sir. No, sir. Everybody wants people to think they're righteous and they want to think themselves righteous and want to persuade God they're righteous. And in doing so, they stumble over the stumbling stone. As Paul tells us the Jews did in Romans chapter 9, refusing to submit themselves unto the righteousness of God, refusing to trust Jesus Christ alone for acceptance with God. And if you are yet without faith in Christ, you're yet under the wrath of God, a child of wrath like everyone else, one with a sense of condemnation over you so that you have no acceptance with God. I'll tell you why. I'll tell you why in just a few words. It's because you refuse to give up everything of yours and trust Christ alone. You, you, it's got to leave, well, I, but a man's got to know this. A man's got to feel this. A man's got to do that. A man's got to experience that. When you give it all up, garbage. <laughs> Just garbage. Throw it all away. Manure. Put it in the dung pile. When you can, you'll trust Christ alone. And until you trust Christ alone, you will never count it all but dung. And that comes when God, who commanded the light to shine out of darkness, shines in your heart to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. Now look at verses 8 through 10 in Romans 11. Here's the fourth thing. God the Holy Ghost inspired the Apostle Paul to tell us the cause of reprobation. Now understand this. Lord willing, I'll come back to it in a couple of weeks. But understand this. Reprobation. The casting off of people 
the eternal damnation of men, both the living and those in hell, and those in the last day of judgment. Reprobation is both by God's eternal decree and by God's strict justice. It is both an eternal act and a judicial act. That shouldn't surprise anyone. God purposed everything, everything, both the salvation of his elect and the eternal ruin of the reprobate. And God does everything by strict justice. Nobody goes to heaven just because God purposed it. Merle Hart, if you enter into glory, you'll enter into glory because you fully deserve it. Justice says you've got to have it. That comes only by the doing and dying of the Son of God. And nobody goes to hell just because God purposed it. If you go to hell, you'll go to hell because you refuse to walk in the light God's given you and you refuse to believe on the Son of God. Look at Romans 11, verse 8. Judicial reprobation. That is God's judgment upon Israel as a nation and upon individuals is God's just recompense, God's just right response to man's determined rejection of the gospel. Now listen to me, you who are believers and you who are not, listen to me. It's high time you and I bow to God. If God sends somebody to hell, it's because they deserve it. That includes you and me, your mama and daddy and mine, your sons and daughters and mine. That's fact as revealed in this book. And don't act as though or talk as though or somehow pretend that, uh, well, there's a, here's the exception. Here's the exception. No, no. Everybody's going to hell who refuses to believe on the Son of God. Everybody going to glory who believes on him because they deserve it. Those who believe deserving of everlasting life because they've been made righteous by Christ. Those who refuse to believe deserving of everlasting damnation because they trample underfoot the precious blood of the Son of God. Romans 11 verse 8. According as it is written, God hath given them. They didn't just happen to fall asleep. That's not what it says, Skip. God hath given them. Because they refused the love of the truth. Because they refused the love of the truth, God sent them a strong delusion. God hath given them the spirit of slumber, eyes that they should not see and ears that they should not hear unto this day. That's God's work. That's God's work. And if God shuts you up in darkness, you can't see. You didn't hear that. If you did, you'd tremble for folks and for yourself if you refuse to believe on the Son of God. If God shuts you in darkness, you can't see. If God stops your ears, you can't hear. And the darkness men think they have, the darkness they have, men think is light. And the deafness they have, men think is the sound of God's voice. Verse 9. And David saith, let their table be made a snare. Let the very thing that ought to show them Christ be a snare to them and a trap and a stumbling block and a recompense unto them. Now, if you read where that's quoted from, Psalm 69, you'll find out the one speaking is the Lord Jesus Christ. They've, they've put him to death and the master says, let their table become a snare. Let it become, a, let it be a trap. Let it be a stumbling block to them. Verse 10, let their eyes be darkened that they may not see and bow down their back always. Now here's the long and short of that portion of this text. If you go to heaven, it will be by God's doing. 
You'll have no one and nothing to thank and praise but God, the triune Jehovah, Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. It won't be because your pastor was a better preacher than somebody else. It won't be because you uh, uh, did something somebody else didn't do. It won't be because of who you're related to. Jenny came in this morning. She said she's glad to be here. She said, I'm so thankful. I hope we never take it for granted. I have a good mother and daddy who raised me under the sound of the gospel. If you go to heaven, it won't be because your mama and daddy. Be they good or bad. It'll be because of what God's done. And if you go to hell, it will be your own doing. You'll have no one and nothing to blame but yourself. That's all. But what about his circumstances? Talk to God about it. He doesn't consider them. What about the way they raised him? Talk to God about that. He didn't consider that. But they, they didn't have a chance. They, they, were, they were raised by those uh, do-nothing, ne'er-do-wells, those, those, those people that have no class. They were, they were raised by those folks we, we don't have anything to do with. They were raised good as you were, just good as you were, with the same hearts, with the same depravity, with the same corruption. If you go to hell, you won't blame your circumstances, your mama, your daddy, your brother, your sister, your preacher, even the influence of false religion. You'll have none to blame but yourself. If God saves sinners by grace alone, then it is altogether without works, without merit, without goodness, without something you do. For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. If God has chosen to save some and promised to save any who come to his son, why not me? Why not me? Why not you? Our Savior says, Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I'll give you rest. He didn't say, Come to me, and I'll give you rest if uh, this, you meet this condition or that. He didn't say, Come to me, and, and you, might, you might get rest. He said, come unto me, all ye that labor in heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Are you coming to him? Have you come to him? Will you come to him? If so, it's because of God's grace, God's election, God's redemption. God's providence. Give God the praise. Go home, my brother, my sister, trust in Christ with this word of astonishment in your heart. Of all the peoples of this world, in this day of darkness and judgment, I was spared. Thank you, my God, for your free grace in Christ the Lord. Amen.